um, packet is online. The answers for this review, the, the, the oh, I'm sorry, my English is breaking today. The answers for the <laughs> exam review questions will be up later tonight. Um, it might be a little late tonight, but it'll be up tonight um, when I get those out. So those will be up tonight. Um, Emily in chat, RSI, just said that she sent a message in the group me and she'll be sending out an email. Her test review is tomorrow, 5.50 to 7.50. Um, and she does have a regular session tonight as well. Um, so don't forget that. Um, there's also, I can post Zach's information as well, although I don't think it'll be as well. Not saying that it wouldn't be helpful, but I think Zach's meeting is pretty much the same time as Emily's. Um, so it would be like one or the other. And if she's for our personal class, I would just suggest her, but whatever floats your boat. Um, you can also find any information on NASI by just, I usually just Google University of South Carolina SI whenever I wanna look it up. <laughs> and there's a place where you can find all the SI sessions and you can go to absolutely anyone you want, even if they don't quote unquote cover my class, excuse me. Um, but hers, she'll be sending out an email later. So that stuff's up on Blackboard. We've got to go through 1.8 today. We're only going to go through about, oh my goodness, oh, because I'm an idiot. We're only going to go through about half of 1.8 because it's the stuff that we actually really need to move forward and I'm just going to scrap the rest of it. Um, I was hoping that this wouldn't take all class period, but if it's going to go anything like my class I just had, um, it's going to. <laughs> Um, so let, let's just let's just see how it goes. So section 18 is called new functions from old and we have to talk about these things called compositions. So given functions f and g and let me know if at any point you can't see what I'm doing or it starts freezing up because it's been acting up lately. Given functions f and g where the range of f is contained in the domain of g, we can define the composition which is written formally as kind of g circle f if you will of x this is the formal notation this is the notation that's used way more often <laughs> and i personally always use this notation i think it makes a bit more sense as to what's actually happening so i want to talk about this piece really quick range of f is contained in the domain of g it's not something we have to worry about a lot, but I do want to kind of touch on what that's actually saying. So say we have two functions, say we have x squared minus one and two over x, and I wanted to compose these together. We'll also remember that the domain from way back when is the inputs, I ran out of space, that the domains, the domain, are the inputs, of a function and the range is the outputs. So this is saying that the range of f, so if I think about f, this function f of x here, and say I plug in one here, I'd get one squared minus one, which is zero. If I then think about plugging zero into g, I'd get two over zero, which if you don't already know is really, really bad. You can't divide by zero, it's not a thing. So essentially, I could compose these two functions together, but I would somehow have to restrict um, the numbers I can plug in because I wouldn't want to use one because that results in me plugging in something to G that doesn't work. Again, the vast majority of the ones we deal with, and by that I mean like 99.9% .9 of ones we will deal with, we don't have to worry about that. Um, but it is a thing that you technically need to be able to form a composition. But anyway, okay, that's not what I wanted. So let's look at, come on, oh my God. Kind of the general idea of what a composition is. I like to start off a little weird. Um, so I know there's an F of pancake floating down there, but just bear with me. I have a reason for doing it. So what we have here are technically compositions, but they're kind of like, baby compositions, but I just want to use it to kind of explain what's going to happen here. So if I have that f of x equals 2x squared plus 1, and I asked you to find me f of 1, well, that does result in, an, in, in a number, but what's actually happening there? If you plug in 1, you're doing 2 times 1 squared 
plus one, right? And you could actually say that's equal to three, but this is what you're actually calculating, right? You took that one and you plugged it in for X. That's essentially, is that for Emily SI sessions? Emily, are your SI sessions gonna be on Collaborate? Blackboard? Yeah, there's a part under our class section on Blackboard. I can send the links out again though. It's like the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra thing, right? Yeah, it's on the left hand side. Yeah, and so there's three normally for each session, but then there's one for the test review specifically tomorrow. Uh -huh. So if you click on the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and there it is, there's a little test review thing down here and her normal sessions. So that's where you go for a side sessions. Um, OK, back to. Notes. Now this is kind of the spirit behind compositions is we're going to take things and we're going to plug them into functions, but they're not going to be numbers. <laughs> well, sometimes they'll be numbers, but so what if I asked you to plug in a plus sign? Now I know that doesn't mean anything in terms of like general mathematics to plug in a plus sign, but what would happen there? We would have two times the plus sign squared plus one. We can't actually figure out what that means, but we could do it. And then, you know, kind of stupidly, but what if I asked you for F of pancake? You would take that entire thing pancake and plug it in for the x value. So you'd have two pancakes squared plus one. No matter what is in here, no matter how weird and stupid it looks, you just replace the original x value with whatever is your input now. Now for some reason, most of those are pretty good, but then for some reason once we get to f of x plus one, people start doing weird things. <laughs> But it's the same idea. We're plugging in x plus one. We're going to take that entire thing x plus one and replace it for the original x value. So since it's originally two x squared plus one, we're now going to have two x plus one all squared plus one. And I always suggest just kind of treating the parentheses as part of the input. If you bring over the parentheses, you're in a better space than if you don't, because sometimes you don't need the parentheses but more often than not, you need the parentheses. So it's kind of just better to just think of those parentheses as part of the thing you're plugging in and just take the whole thing with you. But that's the idea behind a composition is we're taking something that's a bit more complicated than just a number and plugging it into a function. Questions on that idea before we make it a bit more concrete? OK, so the inside function. Of a composition is the calculation done first and then the outside function. Is the calculation done last? So if we take this one up here, this two times X squared plus one all squared plus one. If I asked you to let X be five, the first thing you'd have to do is do five plus one, right? That would be the first thing you'd have to calculate. That's our inside function. And then you deal with squaring it, multiplying by two and adding one. And in terms of the generic notation, so say I have some F of G of X. Well, in the generic notation, it's essentially whatever on the inside, whatever is getting plugged in is the inside function. And then the thing on the very outside is the outside function. Um, this idea of inside versus outside is going to come back up in chapter three a lot. Um, so we are going to want to get kind of used to recognizing which one is inside the other. Um, but also when doing these compositions, you always want to remember work inside out. So whenever you're trying to find a composition, work inside out. So let's look at a couple more examples here. Now this first column is similar to what we were just looking at, and then the second column is kind of more formal compositions. So if I say that f of t is t squared and g of t is t plus two, and I want to find f of t plus one. Well, since f of t is telling me take your input and square it, no matter what that input is, this is going to turn out to be t plus one all squared. 
for the love of all that is good and holy. This is not equal to t squared plus one squared. Don't do it. It's not a thing. No. What this is saying is you'd have to do t plus one times t plus one. So you'd have to foil it and it would actually turn out to be t squared squared plus two t plus one. So don't don't distribute exponents, if you will. That that's don't don't do it. <laughs> now, in terms of you know quizzes, exams, and stuff like that, for me, I usually don't care to have you simplify these. So personally, I would say once you're done actually calculating it, just stop. Because if you simplify it incorrectly, then you're going to lose points. But if you just didn't simplify it, then you'd be fine. <laughs> so I usually never ask you to simplify these. Um, so just just know that. So that would be number one. Now number two is slightly different because notice the kind of positioning of the parentheses here. The only thing we're plugging into F is T. Like this plus three is kind of tacked on the end. This technically isn't a composition. I kind of threw it in there just to mess this all up. So number two, as stated, is not a composition. But how we would rewrite this is, well, what is f of t? f of t is t squared. And then I just tack a plus three on the end. So you do want to be slightly careful um, with kind of the positioning of the parentheses. What's actually being um, input here? And here the only input is the t, and the plus three is kind of an afterthought that's just tacked on, tacked on the end. Whereas number three is back to the idea of a composition because now we have more than just t in the um, input piece here. We're inputting t plus h, so we're inputting the entire thing of t plus h. And since f of t tells me that I square my input, I'm going to take my input of t plus h, and I'm going to square it. Once again, that would not, not be equal to t squared plus h squared. So I'm kind of pausing every once in a while to see if questions pop up. So feel free to uh, throw any in there if you got them. But then if we move to this next column, which are a bit more of the formal compositions, Here's where these can get a bit more complicated because the notation is, what do I start with? What do I have? Now, excuse me, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that. There's kind of two ways you can think about this. If you get really good at these, you can usually jump from the beginning to the end. And if, you're, if you already know how to work with these, that's perfectly fine. I'm gonna show you kind of two different tracks you can take. One of them you might prefer over the other, whichever flows your boat. The one I usually go to is you can kind of write an intermediate step. And also, as I said last time, work inside out. So the inside piece is this g of t. Well, what is g of t? It's equal to t plus 2. So I could rewrite this as f of t plus 2. Oh my goodness. 2. And let me just add the color in there just to try to make it even more in your face. <laughs> so you can kind of take an intermediate step and kind of rewrite what that function actually is. And now it looks like something we were just taking care of, where we're saying we're gonna plug t plus two into the function f. The f function says square what your input is. So we're gonna take our input and square it. The other way you can think about it is you can think about actually plugging in g of t. So take g of t and plug it into f. Well, what does f say? It says take your input and square it. So you can actually write that generic notation and just have that be the input and squaring it. The last step for that would just be then rewriting what g of t actually is. And g of t is t plus 2. So we'd end up with t plus 2 squared. So whichever, if one of the, those two is more helpful than the other, um, feel free. If you have another way you like to do them, feel free. Um, I'm not the kind of person who makes you do them my way as long as it's mathematically correct. Um, and I will stress that because sometimes people think they're doing it right, but it's not mathematically correct. <laughs> so just be careful there. But anyway. So. That would be that one. Pausing really quick. The next one is kind of backwards. Instead of plugging G of T into F, we're plugging F of T into G. Um, so I'm going to go this way 
for the most part. If you want me to show the other way, just feel free to tell me and I can do both ways. But to save time, I'm going to start with just using one of them. Um, but of course, if you, anyone wants to see it done the other way, just let me know. Anyway, I'm babbling over actually doing work here. So inside out, f of t is equivalent to t squared. So I can replace that f of t with what it actually is, the actual equation for it, I should say. So since the equation for it is t squared, and then this is telling me that I'm going to take t squared and plug it into g. So my g function tells me take the input and add 2 to it. Whatever I plug in, g of whatever is whatever plus 2. So since our input here is t squared, we're going to have t squared plus 2. With this last one. Now this one, I feel like plugging things into itself freaks people out for some reason. It's the same idea, it's just the same function. Inside out, what is g of t? g of t is t plus 2. And sorry, I'm just trying to write things down so that I don't have to switch back and forth every two seconds, but hopefully my kind of backwards writing isn't confusing people. So I'm taking that inside g of t and replacing it with the equation t plus 2. Now this is telling me take t plus 2, plug it into g. Well, since g of whatever is whatever plus 2, I'll have the input of t plus 2 plus 2. Of course, you could reduce that to t plus 4 if you want, but leaving it here is also perfectly fine. Questions, concerns? Okay. Okay. The other class had lots of questions, so I'm just making sure that we really don't have questions. So, okay. Moving on. Same idea, different functions. <laughs> so, let's say now f of x is e to the x and g of x is 5x plus 1. So, say I first want to find f of g of x. Once again, inside out. So, we have to deal with g of x first. So g of x is 5x plus 1. So let me just rewrite this in terms of that g of x. So I have f of 5x plus 1. That's now telling me that I'm taking 5x plus 1 and plugging it into the f function. So f is e to the x. So f of something is e to the something. Whatever you plug in goes into that exponent. So this is going to become e to the 5x plus 1. OK. In the next one, we have the inside function is f of x. So the first thing I'll do is change that over to its actual equation, which is e to the x. Now this is saying take e to the x and plug it into g. Excuse me. So since g of x this essentially says take the input, multiply it by 5, add 1. So 5 times the input plus 1. 5 times the input of e to the x plus 1. Uh, maybe I, I said take the parentheses always, and then I have been dropping parentheses. But So again, in some case, you don't need them. Neither of these cases did you really need them, but sometimes you will need them. So, you know what, I'm just going to take them off of that one again. All right. Now we've got a function being plugged into, oh, sorry, what up? A uh, quick question on number six. Yeah. Um, if it was g of g of t, why wouldn't it be t plus two plus t plus two? If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I'm just trying to figure out the best way to explain it. So let me write what you said in red. So t plus 2 plus t plus 2, I believe is what you said, if I'm remembering correctly. So 
what we're doing here is we're taking this input of g of t and plugging it in for g. Now, if I just go up to g really quick and kind of do a little side note, if I asked you for g of five. Um, oh, I understand now, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it's just the one input of t plus two. So we only have one occurrence of t plus two. I understand, thank you for your help. Uh, so let me just clear that up a little bit. There we go. Okay. All right. So this one, we're plugging a function into itself, um, but we're starting with the inside of f of x. So let me rewrite this to be f of e to the x. This one might look a bit weird because now we're taking e to the x and making it the exponent of e to the x. So this would turn into e to the e to the x. And I am going to put parentheses around this one. Technically, it's not needed, but I'll put them up there just for giggles. Um, this one may be all right as, um, you know, this would turn into e to the f of x and kind of that other way that I've been talking about, which again would turn exactly into this. So we're taking e to the x and plugging it into e to the x, which would give us e to the e to the x. The input completely replaces the x that was there. Just in case I'm running into myself here. So now we're starting with the inside of g of x, so let's rewrite that. Let's have g of 5x plus 1. So again, whenever we're plugging these things in, it's essentially replacing the x that was originally there. So in g of x, we have 5x plus 1, but now that x is becoming 5x plus 1. It's becoming this entire input. So we're going to have 5 times 5x plus 1 plus 1. I'm getting a message that usually means that someone can't see my screen. So. so we had to take that entire input of 5x plus 1, plug it into the equation 5x plus 1, which is a, um, I don't know, my English broke. Does that make sense? Questions, concerns? Okay. No, it's okay. All right. I just see it so often that I honestly think sometimes people do it on accident when they can't see my screen and they think it'll help. <laughs> so whenever I see it, I just reshare. All right, moving on then. So now we're kind of going to go backwards. So here we have a composition, and I essentially want to break it up into two functions that when I compose them together, I would get what I have here. So essentially, we want to look for the inside function versus the outside function. And again, this idea is going to be something we're really going to pull from again in a couple of chapters. So anyway, so here I have y equals the natural log of 3t. So I kind of have two functions going on here. I have a natural log and I have a 3t. So I'm essentially going to break those two up, but I need to be careful how I break them up because the natural log by itself doesn't make any sense. So I'm starting with y, so I'm going to have that here. And so let me say that this is actually made up of the natural log of something. And let me name that something z. Well, what was that something? What was the inside function here? That was 3t. So I've taken this technically a composition and broken it up into kind of its two pieces such that if I were to compose these together, if I were to take this z value and plug it in here, but z equals 3 to the t, I would end up with what I started with. So I kind of decomposed it in a way. I took the composition and I broke it down into pieces. 
And number two, I want you to think about it for like five seconds before I say the answer. Think about which function you think is inside of another. Like there's technically kind of two functions going on here. And I want you to think for five seconds before I go over the answer. Which one looks like it's inside something else? Not necessarily looking for anyone to actually say the answer, but just think about it for two seconds. The thing I would say is on the inside is this 2r plus 3. Partly because it's inside parentheses, nudge, nudge. But since that's kind of what's inside, if you think about kind of what's going on here, I have 5 times something squared. So I could write this function as 5 times something squared, where I'm just naming that something z. And then I can say, well, that z was 2r plus 3 in this specific case. And again, now I've decomposed it to a place where if I take this z value and plug it in here, I get what I started with. So I'm taking what I start with, breaking it up into pieces. Okay. This last one. I want to break up into two pieces. Well, I kind of have an e to the x going on, and then I have that negative 0.03t piece going on. So I could break this up and say that this is ultimately an e to the something. But in this specific case, that something was 0.03t. And again, if I were to plug in that value of z into that e to the z form, I would get what I started with. And let me just, for the sake of Having this all look uniform, I did it on the other ones. Let me do it on this one too. So I take that, plug it in there. <laughs> I get what I started with. Does that make sense? So I will say sometimes with these, there are multiple correct answers. Uh, usually there's one that's quote unquote more correct than another, but not necessarily with one in three, but I could see a couple different answers for two. Uh, even if I didn't really like it, there's the one that I presented is kind of the most correct answer. There's technically another way you could have broken it up. Um, but this is the most helpful way to break it up, especially for how we're going to need to use it later. Questions, concerns on that idea. Okay. <laughs> Please don't be afraid to ask me questions. I'm just slightly concerned because my other class had so many questions, which is fine. You can also just not have questions. That's perfectly fine too. But if you're confused, let me know. <laughs> all right, what's different about this one? Well, first of all, we, first, oh my goodness. First off, we got a table. And these answers are actually going to come out to be numbers, not functions. And that's because I'm actually plugging in numbers here instead of just X or T or a variable. So once again, with these compositions inside out. So the first thing you want to find. Is f of zero. And if you're not sure how to read this table, essentially if you want an f of x value, so f of x and zero and then you just kind of, you know. Meet yourself in the middle of the table. So f of zero is going to be equal to three and I'm going to do a little bit of kind of backwards writing again. So now we end up with g of 3 because f of 0 is equal to 3. And now we're left with, well, now I need to figure out what g of 3 is. Well, g of x at 3, well, well at 3, <laughs> gives us 6. So the final answer here would be 6 because there's nothing else to do now. So if I go down to the next one. I'm going to keep pausing after each one just in case there's a question. Inside out, start with G of zero. G of zero is coincidentally zero. So now we end up, whoa, I was about to write the wrong thing. We end up with having to calculate F of zero. Which is F of zero and three. Sorry, can you do the first one again? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah, 
So the first thing we want to calculate is f of zero. We want to work inside out. So the thing that I've underlined in orange. So if we go to f and zero and kind of meet ourselves on the table, we get to three. So f of zero became three. So then I'm looking to calculate g of three. g, three, meet yourself on the table, got us to six. Gotcha. And I'll leave that here over here. Number three. Inside out, g of one, g one gets us two. And again, sorry, I'm kind of writing these backwards because of colors. Uh, so f of two, f of two would get us negative one. Number four, f of one. f of one is coincidentally one. So we're left with g of one. g of one, g of one is two. And these last two, we have the function being plugged into itself, but it's still the same idea. I should bounce back forward. Find f of zero first. f of zero was three. So now we want to find f of three, where that f is coming from the f that was in the problem. f of three is negative three. Our last guy here. Inside out, so g of zero. g of zero is coincidentally zero. So this one turns out to be a bit silly, but again, this g is coming from that arrow went a little too far. And then we need g of zero, which is so. Excuse you, screen. What are you doing? G of zero is still zero, so the actual answer is zero. <laughs> Questions, concerns on that? Okay. Um, well, that's all I had. <laughs> that's all we had to get through for one eight. Um, this is fair game for your exam. So if you have questions, let me know. <laughs> so these ideas are fair game on your exam. Um, I will say I tend to focus more on the functions and table ideas as opposed to the decomposing like this example for. This is still fair game, but if there's no room left in your brain, you should know the other two facts first. Um, so at this point, no use starting anything else because nothing else is gonna be on your exam. So what I'll do now for the last 15, 15 minutes, I'll stick around. If you guys have questions um, about anything that's gonna be on the exam, about if you wanna review a specific topic, if you wanna talk about the homework, um, this can be a time to do to do that. For example, four, did you pick Z just because just because I could have made that any variable I wanted to. I could have made it a an X, uh, not a Y because I was already using Y, not a T because I already have T, but absolutely any other thing I wanted to make it. I could. I just chose Z because I wanted to. <laughs> so otherwise, um, I'm not forcing you to stay around for the last 15 minutes. Fifth, oh my lord, 15 minutes if you would like to leave. If you have questions about anything or anything concerning exams and work. Um, oh, one last thing though. I will be putting some examples on Wiley from 1.8. They are purely optional, and I will state that in very big capital letters. Um, 
that it's not something that you have to do this week. There is no homework this week. There's the one that's due tonight. There's still the thing due tonight. But in terms of this week that's about to show up, there is no homework because we have the exam. But I will put up a couple of questions on Wiley from 1.8 because that was the new material that you haven't had homework on yet. So if you would like to do those, you can. Um, otherwise, you don't need to. I think Wiley can also get a little gross with 1.8, so be aware of that. One second, Lexi. I'm confused about changing exponential functions from one form to the other. If you don't mind, could you? I could go over that, yeah. Lexi, is it a content question or like a, a question about a like exam? Question. <laughs> Um, for our homework that's due tonight, is it just the one that's like 1.5 through 1.7? Because I yes. know like last time we didn't do the 1.5 part of that one homework. So yeah, it's the entire 1.5 through 1.7. Um, so like, do we have to go back to that homework from last week and do the one? No, 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 no. Everything okay. that used to be on that one from 1.5 is now on this one. So just focus on the one that says 1.5 to 1.7. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, and now I've got to share my screen again to this. Okay, so we've, okay, not that. And uh, not green. Um, and super quick before I actually go through um, the changing of forms, I do want to say something really quick. So if you see the word rate, you're using the A to the T form. If you see the words continuous rate, you want to use the E to the KT form. Um, so that's one thing is if you see a question and it says continuous, just go straight to using this form. I had a couple people who were going to the A to the T form and then switching over. That's not what you need to do. When you want to switch forms, they will say something like convert to the other form. If it doesn't say something like convert to the other form, then you don't want to use this process at all. But anyway, how do we do it? <laughs> so look at these two equations right here. Notice that they both have a P naught. Notice that they both have a T. Notice that the only thing that's different, therefore, is this a versus the e to the k. And we're essentially going to use that to our advantage. Because essentially what I want here is I want these two to mean the same thing. So if I want them to mean the same thing, they need to be equal. Well, the p naughts can just be equal because they're both p naught. The t's can just be equal because they're both t's. So the only thing that I have to like force to be the same is the a and the e to the k. So say I start with something like, um, well, let me actually do a number, geez, uh, 60, uh, 1.12 to the T. And I want E to the KT. So I have an A to the T, I want an E to the KT, and I'm gonna use this relationship that I just found, where it was, if I want these two things to be the same, it must be the case that this A value of 1.12 must be equal to e to the k. There's no other way to make that happen. Make those two things the same if that doesn't happen. So if I want to solve for k, I'm going to take the natural log of both sides because I have to solve for something that's in an exponent. And if I have the natural log of e to the k, I can also bring that k outside. So I'd end up with the natural log of 1.12 equals k natural log of e. Natural log of e is 1, so you can kind of just drop it. So then the last thing we would have to do is kind of punch this into our calculator. Well, what is the natural log of 1.12? Natural log of 1.12 is 0 0.11. Let's just go with 33. So that tells me the k value I want for this new form, and everything else is going to stay the same. So the p naught isn't going to change, and the variable of t isn't going to change. So we would have 60e to the 0 0.1133t. I'm not going to do this one out fully um, because I have a couple other questions that are coming in, but if I had something like 
this and I want it to convert to the other form. Again, the only thing we have to set equal here is a and e to the k. So we have a is e equal to e to the 0 0.5 and that you just punch into a calculator. The test will be 50 minutes, yes. Is it Abby? Okay. Hold on a second. Okay, so let's talk about that one really quick, and then Caitlin, I will get to yours, I promise. Um, so you're talking about the one that, so everyone's numbers might be different, but it's something like Hershey, it's about Hershey, I think, right? I don't know. Uh, so in 2011, annual sales, uh, 6.1 billion, increasing uh, continuous rate of 7%. Email me, Aiden, um, and then uh, everyone who emails me will get an email <laughs> about, um, I haven't worked out some of the very fine details, but it will be coming out to you soon if you email me and let me know that you can't make it on Wednesday. Okay, so one thing I'm noticing here is a lot of people are going about the continuous the wrong way. So notice it says the word continuous. Since it says the word continuous, we're looking at e to the kt. We're not not using the a to the t form. Since it says continuous, we're forced to use the e to the k t form. This does not mean find a to the t and then do this. That's not what that's saying. It's just saying just go straight to the e to the k t form. So if I want some p naught e to the k t, well, my p naught is still my initial condition, which in this case, in this person's case, would be 6.1. And then my k value, now my k value is literally just the continuous rate. There's nothing I need to do with it like I need to do in the a case. So since this is equal to 0 0.07, and it would be positive because we're increasing, this is the k value. So we would just have 0 0.07 to the t. And then you use this equation to answer the last two pieces of the problem. So hopefully that, that helped, hopefully. Okay, Caitlin, number seven. Is that just like straight up number seven or is it, because um, I know on the side it says like Q7, but then it gives like section blah, 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 blah. Um, on my homework, it just is under number seven, like chapter one, section 1.5, question seven. Okay. 1.5, question seven. So the reason um, I'm jumping back to this question I was just talking about, the reason that's not the A value is because of this word continuous right here. If it says continuous, it's E to the KT. If it just says rate, it's A to the T. So that's a big difference. Which one do I use? If it's just the word rate, it's A to the T. And in that case, your rate would be R. If it says continuous, that means it's E to the KT and that rate is the K value. So it really depends on that word continuous. Um, question seven. Okay, let me see. Load by Lee. Oh, that one. Okay. Well, one of those. So, whoops. Okay. So, I love that you have P naught equals 35. Awesome. Totally need that. But now we need to figure out what our A value is. So, we want some P equals P naught A to the T. We have two points here. We technically have 0, 35 and 40, 7. 
So way back in 1.5, we looked at a process for finding the uh, exponential equation given two points. So we're going to use that kind of idea. So we're going to take these two points. There's a little bit of a shortcut here, but I'm not going to do it because I think it's better to just focus on one process instead of saying that multiple ones can have shortcuts. Anyway, so in that process, what we did was we took these two points and we wrote them like this. So I would have seven equals, don't know what P, well, I do know what P naught is. Let me go ahead and write it in. Usually we don't know what P naught is, but since I have it, why don't I put it in there? Um, and then to the 40th and then 35 equals 35 A to the zero. And then we always divided the two equations. So we put the two points in the format of the equations and we're going to divide the two. Seven divided by 35 is 0 0.2. These 35s cancel each other out. A to the 40th divided by A to the zero is just A to the 40th. We can now take the 40th root of both sides, which is equivalent to the one over 40 power, which is 0 point, they wanted two decimal places, so this would chop off at 9, 6. So then the equation you're looking for, well, P naught was 35, then 0 0.96 to the T. I went through that a little fast. Did that make sense, Caitlin? Yes, ma'am, that, that actually did make sense. Thank you. Uh, and Caitlin, I answered Abby's. Do you mind doing some half life and doubling time problems from 1 7? Sure. And that seems like it's the last question. I feel like it's not Let's see. I guess I could just pull one off the top of my head. Um, That's always a little dangerous, but we can do it, I think. Or is there, um, I think that was Madia. Did you have a specific one in mind or just a gen generic doubling time or half life? Generic? Cool. So since we did a half life one in class, I'm going to think of a doubling time. Um, and I'm just going to pull it off the top of my head, so it's going to be stupid. But let's say. Uh, population of bunnies uh, starts with 10 but 15 bunnies and the population is increasing increasing at a rate of 8% per year. Uh, what is the doubling time? Our class time is officially over in case anyone need, has anywhere and any, anywhere to be. Um, but I can still stick around for a little while. And of course, I'm going to finish this one. <laughs> so we've got a population of bunnies. Um, now, note that it says rate and nowhere in here does it say continuous. Caitlin, um, it's because of your notation. Because Wiley is picky as all can be. Put parentheses around that exponent and you should be good. If you lost points on it, send me an email and I can fix it. Anyway, back to this thing. So we have the word rate, but we don't have the word continuous. So we are in the A to the T form because we don't have continuous, but we have the word rate. So we have that our P naught, our initial condition is gonna be 15 bunnies. Now the rate, which gives us the R value, is 0 0.08. But remember with this a to the t form, we kind of have this extra step of needing to add one to that rate to get the a value. 
So A is going to be equal to 1.08. So the equation we're looking at is 15, no, 1.08 to the T. And I even went a step further here. We didn't even need to know what P naught is, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so I'm going to do a side note in a second. So if we want to know the doubling time, we want to solve for T when the initial amount doubles. What's well, double 15? It's 30. So we're going to set this equal to 30. Say you didn't know what P naught is. Let me take a side note really quick because we don't technically need to know P naught. Say all I knew is that the population was increasing by 8%, but I don't know what the population started with. I can still solve doubling time and half-life questions because what I can do is if I want the initial value to double, let me just say it's twice the initial value. And that's going to work because the first step we're going to do is divide by P naught, so it's going to cancel those P naughts out. So we don't even need to know what P naught is in half-life and doubling time questions. You just set it equal to twice, or if it was half-life, so extra side note, if it was half-life, you know, you would set whatever your equation is, and it would have to be decay, so it would have to be something like this, um, equal to one-half P naught. So you can always solve these even if you don't have the initial condition. But we had it here, so why not just put it in and then just double it? So if we want to solve for t here, first step is divide by size by 15, because here we have an exponential that we need to isolate. So we have 1.08 to the t equals 2, which is the reason you can do it without the p naught, because it just reduces down to this 2. It's lagging. You don't see what I highlighted. There we go. Now that I have the exponential um, isolated, I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. Can I drink tea? Bring the power out. Finish solving for T by dividing by the natural log of 1.08. And punch that sucker in the calculator. <laughs> It's approximately nine. So for these, you really need to know the rate, and that's about it. Because we can all, we will, oh my gosh. We want to set up the equation that we have to work with. And then we can use our logarithm stuff to be able to solve for t. Does that make sense, Maya? Cool. Kai, um, if you can't come to campus on Wednesday, there are a few final details I haven't worked out yet, um, but it's going to run very similarly to how the quizzes would run. Um, so you'll need to be there during the exact time. You'll need to be there on Teams. You'll need to have a webcam. And there might be one other particular thing that I throw in there for extra security, but I haven't um, fully decided if that will be able to work yet. But it will run similarly to how it's been running. And anyone who can't come on Wednesday will have an email sent out um, before the exam with all of the details. Number 14. Let me look at what. Wait, you said an extra form of security for people who are in class or? No, people who oh, okay. can't physically be in class. If okay. you're in class, it's just going to be a paper exam. Yeah. Uh, average rate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one. This is this is the stupid one, Will. And if you've lost point, whoa, what have I done? If you've lost points on this, let me know and I will fix it. Um, but here's what's technically happening. Um, 
So let's say, so you're just talking about the average rate of change piece. So you have a number, oh Lord, what am I doing? Um, I'm looking at someone else's problem though. So you should have a number, two numbers in part B. Um, this person has 7.32 and 7.72. So it's a different person's work. Um, so your numbers might be different. But so essentially, if we want to find the average rate of change in the population between 2020 and 2015, we'd essentially want the population in 2020 minus the population in 2015 over 2020 minus 2015. So in this case, with this person's numbers, I would have something like 7.72 minus 7.32 over um, 2020 minus 2015. Um, and there's a slight nuance at the very end, which is the biggest pain in the butt. Um, nope, no, that's 0 0.04. Oops, oops. So this person would get something like 0 0.08. Now, if you input that, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> and here's why. And I hate it. And I always mean to remove this one. And I always forget. If you notice on the rest of the problem, it will say billions. But then in the very last blank, where you would be tempted to put 0 0.08, it says millions. <laughs> because why not, I guess? I don't know, Wiley hates us all. So what you would want to do is you would want to take the number that you get, move the decimal place over three places, and input that number. So she'd want to put in 80. Um, if you had something like 0 0.085, you'd want to input 85. If you've wasted too many attempts with the quote unquote correct answer, and you've lost points on it, totally let me know, just shoot me an email, and I can fix it. But that's probably the issue. Maybe the issue is finding it, but there's also the issue with the stupid change in units that just randomly comes out of nowhere. <laughs> OK, yep, you're welcome. Any more quick questions? I have to be somewhere at 230. And I need to breathe before I do that, <laughs> but I can probably answer another quick one or two. If anyone has any more questions. How to do decay rate? I got time, Caitlin, it's all right. Um, do you got a specific question in mind or? Um, okay, yes, ma'am. So on the Wiley homework, um, it's chapter one, section one point five, question two. I know how to do it, but on the first oh, one. Oh no, I think this is Wiley being a complete doofus. Okay, maybe not, but it's okay. <laughs> no wait. Okay. Well, no. Let me see what you put in other times. Free Bobby Schmurda, bro. Sorry, I can do that. I don't know why everyone is so quiet. Uh, let me turn up my volume. So I sent out an email about this, but it's 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 partially Wiley being silly. I think you were totally on the right track with one of your attempts. But anyway, let's look at this. So we've got 90, 0 0.91 to the T. So that means A equals 0 0.91, right? But since they ask for the rate, we want R. Well, if A is 1 plus R, subtract 1 from both sides, and you get that, whoops, you get that R is equal to A minus 1. So if we take this A value and subtract 1 from it, we will get R, which, no, this gives negative 0 0.0. 0, 0.09 equals R. Yeah, so I think you're on the right track with one of your answers. So you would probably want to say 9% decay. So I'm probably, I'm going to check the second one. But anyway, now what Wiley wanted, because Wiley 
blue. They wanted you to input it as negative 9%. Why? I honestly don't know because I totally agree with almost everyone who's input this quote unquote incorrectly that saying a 9% decay rate kind of takes care of the fact that it's negative. So I don't know why Wiley is expecting a negative there. Um, let me triple check your other one. So it's the same idea. We're going to subtract one from this A value. So 0 0.934 minus 1 is negative 0 0.066. Uh, this one was off slightly. Um, so we'll want to input it correctly. So this should be 6.6%. Um, but again, for some reason, Wiley wants it as a negative. So you definitely had the right idea here. Um, it's mainly Wiley being a weirdo. But anyway, did that make sense? Yes, ma'am, because I was kind of confused on that one. Yeah, no, but thank totally. You. I see why well, what you're inputting is I would have accepted 9% decay rate. That's totally what it is. I do not know why they want a negative on that. Um, so just put in negative nine and negative. Let me triple check. Yeah, negative 6.6 .6, and you'll be good. And that would be your fourth attempt. So you don't lose points. So hooray. OK, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>